Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Kilpatrick Townsend's webinar regarding the employer-related provisions of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. We filled a lot of questions and concerns regarding the act in the last less than a week since it was enacted. Thus, we're hosting this webinar in the hopes of easing some of the anxiety by providing a clear understanding of the contents and what it does or does not do. My name is John Delayla Neely Holston, and I'm a partner on Kilpatrick Townsend's Labor and Employment Team. My associate, Leah Farmer, and I will be your presenters today. Leah? Hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here talking with you. I know this is an area of great concern for many of our clients, so we're very happy to be able to speak with you today. Um, as Yandalela mentioned, we've been following and tracking this legislation and wanted to take this opportunity to provide you with a clear, plain English overview of the new law and its requirements for employers. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Today, uh, just so you have sort of an outline of what, um, what sort of brought us to where we are, I want to kind of walk through some of the key timeline. So in late December of 2019 is when we first started getting reports of a, a novel coronavirus coming out of China. Um, the confirmed cases then clearly started occurring around the world. Um, by January 20th, we had our first confirmed case here in the U.S. And shortly thereafter, by January 31st, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services had already declared a public health emergency. By March 11th, the World Health Organization, or WHO, had characterized um, this as a pandemic. Uh, by March 13th, on March 13th, President Trump declared a national emergency. Um, and the very next day, March 14th, the House of Representatives passed the first version of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, they followed that first version shortly thereafter on March 16th with a second passed version of the act. Um, while the House said that they were making technical changes, we saw some very large substantive changes um, in the second version of the act. On March 18th, the Senate passed the second version uh, with no amendments, and the President signed that into law on the same day. Um, April 2nd, uh, coming up here soon, is the date by which these provisions must be effective. So we have a little bit of time before the effective date, um, but not too much to get um, everyone's workplace in order. I'll turn it back over to Yandalela now. As the timeline that Leah set out demonstrates, this is a rapidly evolving situation. Both the nature of the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic, and the country's response are all changing daily. Just last week, we saw many Americans ordered to shelter in place. Numerous others are under curfews, are strongly encouraged, if not mandated, isolation and social distancing orders. To make matters more complicated, the sources of these directions are not uniform on any level, federal, state, or local. And then in comes the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, creating a new set of requirements for employers. However, it seems like the number of workers who are impacted by the law will be much lower than originally anticipated. According to a Washington Post article from March 19, 2020, which seems like eons ago with the way things change, 7.4 million American workers work at companies who are not covered by the new law. Another 2.2 million American workers are employed by businesses that the Secretary of Labor may exempt from the new law. So this leaves approximately 1.3 million workers who might be eligible for relief under the new law. Leah? So as we walk through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act today, we're not going to cover all the different divisions of the act. We're focusing instead on the three key provisions um, that we've identified that we think are most urgent and require employers to fully understand the provisions. So we'll talk first about the amendments to the Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, we'll transition then into the newly created emergency paid sick leave and talk about 
what that covers, what it doesn't cover. Um, and finally, we'll wrap up by talking about the federal tax credits that are included in the new law. Um, and while we won't be taking questions today during this webinar, um, you can certainly email us additional questions uh, through the platform. You can reach out to us after the webinar, um, or certainly you can contact your primary Kilpatrick Townsend representative. So as Leah indicated, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act contains several sub-acts. We're focusing on the two that are the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Extension Act and the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. First, the Emergency Medi Family, Medical, Family and Medical Extension Act does exactly what it says. It expands the Family and Medical Leave Act. As a result, during this webinar, I will often refer to it as the Expansion Act. So the Expansion Act expands the leave. The employee is covered and the employer is covered. However, it does not change the 12-week limit on FMLA leave. Instead, the Inspection Act modifies Section 102A1 of the FMLA. Section 102A1 of the FMLA sets forth the circumstances in which FMLA leave is available. The Inspection Act adds a provision F to provide for leave for a qualifying need related to a public health emergency. A qualifying need related to a public health emergency is when the employee is unable to work or telework due to a need to care for a son or daughter under 18 if their place of child care or school or their child care provider has been closed or is, unable, or is unavailable due to, quote, public health emergency. Under the Expansion Act, a public health emergency is an emergency related to COVID-19 as declared by the federal, state, or local government. And for child care provider, that's someone who receives compensation for providing child care services on a regular basis. So if an employee has a young child being watched at home by a relative who doesn't normally get paid to watch a child, loss of that child care would not be covered, as the term child care provider is defined in the Expansion Act. We also want to note that telework is specifically included here. So if the employee can telework, they cannot receive this leave. This language was one of the amendments made to the bill on the way to the Senate. All right, I believe we are having, I am having challenges um, technologically. So please bear with us. Okay, so who is covered? The public health emergency leave is available to any and all employees who have worked for the employer for at least 30 calendar days. It does not matter if the employee is part-time or full-time or the number of hours the person has worked for the employer during that period. This is a marked departure from the 12-month, 1,250-hour requirement for other types of FMLA leave. Similarly, while employers with less than 50 employees are not subject to other provisions of the FMLA, they are subject to the Expansion Act as currently drafted. Indeed, the Act applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. The Expansion Act gives the Secretary of Labor authority to issue regulations exempting small businesses with fewer than 50 employees, healthcare providers, and first responders from this Act. So far, the Secretary of Labor has not exercised this authority. Thus, as of now, if you have between 1 and 499 employees, you are covered by the Expansion Act. So what does that mean? It means that you have to provide up to 12 weeks of FMLA leave for a qualifying public health emergency. Unlike other FMLA leave, the majority of this leave is paid. Under the Expansion Act, the first 10 days of the public health emergency leave may be unpaid. However, the employee has the ability to substitute existing accrued vacation leave, personal leave, or medical or sick leave for the unpaid time. This substitution is completely at the employee's election. The remaining 10 weeks of leave, i.e. 12 weeks minus 10 days, and I have no idea why they chose to mix days and weeks, but there's a lot of other things wrong with this act too. But the remaining 10 weeks of leave is paid. It's paid at an amount not less than two-thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay. 
for the number of hours the employee would otherwise normally be scheduled to work. So you could be thinking much like we are, um, the otherwise normally that an employee would otherwise be normally scheduled to work is a pretty vague provision for trying to figure out the amount of leave that part-time employees are entitled to. Um, well, at least you know that we agree with you. Um, where it would be unclear, luckily, how many hours a part-time employee would have worked based on the employee's fluctuating week-to-week -week schedule, the Act does include a varying schedule hours calculation that relies upon either a six-month average of hours or in the situation where an employee has not been employed for six months, it looks to the reasonable expectations of the employee at the time of hire. So it's important to note there that they're looking not at the employer's reasonable expectation for how many hours the employee would be working, but the employee's. Um, how exactly that will be determined is, is yet to be revealed. It, we could see something about that in the regulations when we get those, um, but currently the, the Act is silent on that. Um, of additional note, uh, the Act does provide a cap on the total amount to be paid to any one employee for a public health emergency leave. So the Act, even though this leave roughly, you know, 12 weeks minus 10 days um, must be paid, it's capped at $200 per day or $10,000 in the aggregate per employee. So depending on how much leave the employee takes, if they don't take the full time, then obviously they wouldn't reach that $10,000 cap, um, but it does at least limit in some way the amount of liability that an employer would be facing under this new provision. And this cap was new to the amended second version of the act. It was not present at all in the first uh, version of the bill passed by Congress. Um, and we'll talk about tax credits a little bit at the end, but also employers will be able to take some tax credits, um, which I'm not gonna get into too much here, but do know that this, this bill, just like the emergency paid sick leave, has tax credits, and we'll talk about those after we talk about the emergency paid sick leave. Um, so uh, I'll turn it back over to Yonda Layla now. Thanks, Leah. So the standard job protections and restoration normally included in the FLA apply to public health emergency leave. However, those protections do not extend to the employees of employers with less than 25 employees when certain conditions are met. And those are conditions are that the position held by the employee does not exist due to economic conditions or other changes in operating conditions of the employer that affect employment and are caused by COVID-19 emergency as declared by the federal, state, or local government. And the employer makes reasonable effort to restore the employee to an equivalent position, or if those efforts fail, the employer makes effort to contact the employee if an equivalent position becomes available during the next year period. Also, it's worth noting that the certification requirements of the FMLA typically apply to a request for leave under subparagraph C or D of paragraph one or three of section 102A. All that means is that they likely don't apply here because the family, the Emerging Family and Medical Leave Extension Act adds a new provision, section F to section 102A1. So that provision is not currently covered by section 103, it's currently drafted, and the Expansion Act does not amend or address section 103. Thus, it seems you cannot ask employees to provide certification that they qualify for this expanded FMLA leave. That being said, in most instances, when schools or childcare are closed or are unavailable due to a COVID-19 emergency as declared by the federal, state, or local government, the employer will likely know. Further, if the need for leave is foreseeable, the employee must provide the employer with notice of leave as is practicable. And as Leah mentioned, this law takes effect no later than April 2nd, 2020, and it expires on December 31st, 2020. This takes us to the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. The Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act creates a new category of paid leave for employees who are unable to work 
or telework, again, an addition added um, after the bill was passed, but before it was passed by the Senate, due to a need for leave because, one, the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, two, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider, i.e. a doctor of medicine, authorized to practice medicine or surgery in the state in which the doctor practices, um, to quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. Are the employees experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and is seeking medical diagnosis? I want to stop here and emphasize the and is seeking medical diagnosis language, which is explicitly included in the statute. Thus, it makes it seem that employees simply experiencing symptoms does not appear to be sufficient for this paid sick leave. Rather, the employee must also be visiting a doctor for a diagnosis. There are, in addition to the employee specific reasons that an employee can take leave under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, employees can also take leave to care for others. Specifically, an employee can take paid sick leave to care for someone who is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, to care for someone who has been advised by a health care provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19, to care for a son or daughter because their school or daycare or other child care provider is closed or unavailable, quote, due to COVID-19 precautions. A couple of things to note about the child care provision. First, unlike the FMLA Expansion Act, the Paid Sick Leave Act does not define child care provider. So as you recall earlier, we noted that under the Expansion Act, child care provider is someone who is typically providing child care for compensation. There is no definition in the Paid Sick Leave Act. Second, due to COVID-19 precautions, which is what you need under the Paid Sick Leave Act, is vague and much broader than the Expansion Act, which says that child care is unavailable due to, quote, a COVID-19 emergency as declared by the federal, state, or local government. So government declared emergency versus COVID-19 precautions are the difference between the FMLA expansion child care provision and the paid sick leave child care provision. In addition to the provisions for caring for others and the employee's own conditions, there's a catch-all provision for leave when the employee is experiencing quote, any other substantially similar condition specified by, the, specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of Labor. We have no idea what that means, but presume that that condition has not yet been met. What you will note is that what is not covered is that the employee is unable to work or telework due to shortage of work or because the employer is experiencing financial hardship. There is nothing in the paid sick leave or the expansion, the expanded FMLA leave that deals with situations where the employee can't work due to lack of work. Leah? So this will leave us with the question of who is covered. So the act <laughs> includes some language that if you just leave, read the new law would still leave you wondering. Um, each employee employed by the employer um, defines employees who are covered. So that means that regardless of length of employment, um, all employees will be covered if their employer is a covered is a covered employer under the law. Um, just like the FMLA amendments, this portion of the law covers employers with fewer than 500 employees. Um, and similarly, again, the Secretary of Labor may issue regulations exempting smaller employers, um, health care providers, and emergency responders. Um, we still don't know yet whether or not uh, the Secretary of Labor will issue such regulations, um, but the Act does consider that it, it may happen. Um, under, just to provide a little bit of extra clarity, under Section 203 of the FLSA, employee has a very broad definition. It's broadly defined as any individual employed by the employer. Um, employer is defined to include any person acting directly or indirectly in the interest of an employer in relation to an employee and includes a public agency, but does not include any labor organization 
other than when acting as an employer or anyone acting in the capacity of officer or agent of such labor organization. So even when we look to the FLSA's definitions, which this law requires us to do, we are definitely still left with some ambiguities in those definitions. We do know that this would apply to both public and private employers. That's explicitly included in the act. And we do know that it's going to have the fewer than 500 employees cap. So on to the type of leave that's covered. Full-time employees, I think we're one slide ahead. Full-time employees are entitled to take up to 80 hours of paid sick leave, while part-time employees are entitled to generally the average number of hours the employee would usually work in a typical two-week period. Paid sick leave may not be carried over, and the Act specifically states that it, quote, ceases beginning with the employee's next scheduled work shift immediately following the termination of the need for paid sick time, end quote. We've interpreted this to mean that this leave is essentially one and done. Once you take it, you're done. You don't take it piecemeal over the course of a year, and it's definitely not going to carry over um, from one year to the next, especially since the act expires. However, the paid sick leave is available for immediate use by employees. So it doesn't matter if the person's been on payroll one day or 100 days, they have the full gamut of the sick leave available to them. An employer may not require the employee to use other available paid leave first. So this effectively means that employees with child care issues can use their paid sick leave to offset the 10 unpaid days under the extended FMLA and then use the FMLA and then take leave under the employer's plan. Also, after the first work day, an employee receives paid sick leave, the employer may require the employee to follow a reasonable follow reasonable notice procedures in order to continue receiving such paid sick time. This is not a similar requirement in the expanded FMLA, and we think of it as maybe providing opportunity for employers to obtain some type of certification or explanation from employees for the need for leave. However, you do again need to note that the employee gets the day before you can start asking them to follow their reasonable notice procedures. It is also worth noting that there is an anti-retaliation and anti-discrimination provision in the Act and that the Act adopts the penalties under the Fair Labor Standards Act, including liquidated damages, which is double damages, um, for violations of the Act. And in fact, the Act says that to violate it is presumed a violation of the minimum wage and overtime provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Leah? So... Uh, we talked earlier about the sort of seven different reasons that an employee could take this paid sick leave. Well, the reason the employee is taking the paid sick leave will impact the amount of pay they're due from the employer. Um, employees should be paid their regular rate of pay or the minimum wage, whichever is greater, for leave when they're subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order. Um, have been advised by a health care provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19 or are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and, and are seeking medical diagnosis. Those first three reasons we talked about, all of which impact the employee's own personal sickness or, or well-being, those are a regular rate of pay scenario under the law. Um, like the FMLA provision, there is a cap. So paid leave for these employees is capped at $511 per day or $5,110 in the aggregate for all 10 days. Um, in contrast, if an employee is taking leave for any of the reasons we discussed earlier where they're caring for someone else, they're caring for someone who is subject to the quarantine for COVID-19 related reasons or has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or if they're caring for that minor child, their son or daughter, because school or daycare is closed or unavailable. Um, in those instances, paid leave is at two thirds of their regular rate of pay or two thirds of the minimum wage, whichever is greater. That leave is also capped and it's gonna be capped at 
$200 a day or $2,000 in total. So much like we saw with the FMLA provision, these caps were recent additions to the law in the second version. We didn't see these at all in the first version, so we can glean from this that concerns over the total financial burden falling to employers in these acts was something that Congress was considering and that they attempted to address by adding these um, these total caps and daily caps to the amount of, of leave payment employees are due. And just like before, we'll talk about the tax credits um, altogether, uh, which I'm actually going to lead right into now. Oh, nope, I lied to well, you. Well, before Yandale we do that, talk a little bit. yep. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yes, before so. we do that, we're going to talk about a few of the key dates, just so that you guys know. Um, the law requires the secretary to prepare a model notice to employees of their rights under the Act, similar to all the other workplace postings that you have in your workplaces and your break rooms, et cetera, that come from the government. The Secretary of Labor has to prepare one of those for this act um, by March 25th, 2020. So we're two days away from the deadline, which was supposed to be seven days after enactment. Employers must post the notice in a conspicuous place where notices are typically posted. This is going to be a challenge in an environment where many employees are now working remotely. So this may require emailing the notice to employees who are teleworking, but you do need to make sure the information in the poster is communicated. Congress also, it appears, anticipates that there will be challenges calculating the amount of paid leave under the Paid Sick Leave Act. And so the Secretary of Labor has been instructed to issue guidelines to help employers in calculating the amount of paid sick time provided to employees. And those guidelines are supposed to be issued by April 2nd, 2020. The law takes effect no later than April 2nd, 2020. So we expect to see a lot of activity um, from the Secretary of Labor leading up to that. And as we previously mentioned, under, under the other law, the exemptions have not yet come out, but if and when they do, um, certain employers will be exempt. However, like we said, they haven't come out yet. And all of the rights under the law, as well as the regulations, will expire on December 31st, 2020. So now I will turn it over to Leah to explain the tax credits. And one thing, too, you can guarantee when the regulations do come out, we'll be monitoring and tracking those and we'll make sure to provide another client alert talking about the regulations. So that will be something that we continue to monitor. Um, so as we've sort of highlighted a few times, the new law includes tax credits. So these federal tax credits are available for both employers and self-employed individuals, although they'll look a little bit different. So for employers, they're going to have the option of a refundable payroll tax credit. So the legislation, um, the, the new law, provides for a refundable payroll tax credit that covers 100% of the compensation that employers are required to pay under the Act. Um, of real import is that second part, the last part of that sentence, it's 100% of the compensation that employers are required to pay under the Act. So any payments employers make over those, over and above those required, are not going to be eligible for the refundable payroll tax credits. Um, the one exception, one area where we're not seeing a cap right now, has to do with the benefits paid to employees while they're on leave. So employers can also claim a tax credit for the their portion of employee benefits that they pay while the employee is out on leave. And that number currently is uncapped. Um, we'll pay attention to the regulations and make sure that if anything there shifts, we let you know. But as the bill, or as the law is written now, um, that's the one area that's uncapped. So like we talked about earlier, the FMLA leave is capped at $200 a day or $10,000 in total. So that would show us what 
the maximum refundable payroll tax credit is for the actual leave, and then the employer would also be able to take a refundable payroll tax credit for any of the employee's benefits that they paid while the employee was out on leave, and the same would apply to the emergency paid sick leave um, caps. So for, and that's for employers. This is going to be done on a quarterly basis. So every quarter when employers are required to report their payroll taxes, they'll be able to instead report these refundable tax credits. So the, it, you can tell from the legislation that it was important to Congress to try and get money back in employers' hands as quickly as possible. Um, and we presume that's why we don't see some sort of annual tax credit um, or annual refund, but rather, rather we see this quarterly credit, which will help keep the money in employers' hands to sort of offset the, the paid leave they're now responsible for under the law. Um, for self-employed individuals, it's basically the same function. The difference there is that it's an income tax credit as opposed to a payroll credit. Um, those, just like for employers, will be handled on a, quarter, a quarterly basis each calendar quarter um, and are also capped at the qualified sick leave wages um, for the self-employed individual. So just like for employers, the self-employed individual has a, a cap on the amount of tax credits that will be available to them. So this takes us into um, some frequently asked questions. Over the last few weeks, um, as we've spoken to many of you and to many of our other clients, um, we started getting some of the same questions from a lot of different businesses sort of trying to figure out how how this new law is going to impact them and their business. So we compiled a few of those here, um, which you can see. Uh, so we have sort of five frequently asked questions that we'll walk through um, that we've been getting and, and the answers and our reasoning behind those answers. I'll let Jan Delayla start it Thanks. off with the first one. Thanks, Leah. Um, yes, as we mentioned, while we're not taking questions live, and you can always reach out to us with any additional questions you may have following this webinar, we have received the questions listed on this slide from multiple of you multiple times and thought we would at least address those here. Um, one of the first questions that's been getting a lot of attention is how to count your employees. Most people would prefer not to be covered by either of these acts, and so we're in a position of trying to figure out whether you have more than 500 employees. So the questions we've received include, can you count subsidiary corporations and outside employees and employees outside the United States? And so we wanted to address that question first and point out, too, that there are two separate acts. So you have the Expansion Act and you have the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Neither specifically describes how employers should count the number of employees. But we can get guidance from the current FMLA and the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the Expansion Act uses the definitions from the FMLA, the Family Medical and Leave Act. And the Paid Sick Leave Act uses the definitions from the Fair Labor Standards Act. Under the Expansion Act, 50 or more employee, the 50 or more employee thresholds that typically would apply um, in Section 101-4A1 of the FMLA has been substituted for, quote, fewer than 500 employees. However, there's been no modification to the term employee. Thus, if you would normally aggregate, or if you could normally aggregate under the FMLA, then you could aggregate here. We will caution you, though, that you, the 500 or more employees only applies for the Extension Act, so we probably would not want to take a position inconsistent with the positions you've taken with the other provisions of the FMLA and how you implement them. Um, they could cause issues down the road in litigation. We don't know that for a fact, but we did want to caution you to be consistent. However, if you would normally aggregate under the FMLA, then you could likely aggregate for purposes of the Extension Act. The term employee is defined in the FMLA Section 1013 is having the same meaning that is given under Section 203 of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So now both acts have brought us back to the same place. 
which is Section 203 of the FLSA. In that, employee has the broad definition of any individual employed by the employer. Likewise, under the Paid Sick Leave Act, the term employee has the same meaning that's given under 203E of the FLSA. So, while it's true that foreign employees are not subject to the overtime and minimum wage requirements imposed by Section 213 of the Fair Labor Standards Act, they would nonetheless meet the definition of employee, which can only be modified by other FLSA sections which are not applicable here. Thus, we think you can argue, it's arguable that you can count foreign employees while trying to gauge whether you meet the threshold test, but again, caution you against taking any positions solely for these leaves solely for these acts that could hinder you or make challenges down the road with regards to complying with the acts or with other litigation. Leah? So another question we're getting a lot has to do with, is the sick leave under um, the emergency paid sick leave in addition to sick leave already required by state law or local ordinance, or can they run concurrently? We've also been getting the question, can I, you know, I offer voluntary sick leave. Can I require employees to use paid time off under our company's voluntary vacation or sick leave policies before using the paid sick leave? Um, and in this version of the, in the final version of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the one that was signed into law, that answer was left a bit ambiguous. The previous version, which passed the House on March 15, 14th, was explicit. The emergency paid sick leave was in addition to any existing voluntary employer policies um, and was designed to complement existing state law. That version of the Act actually forbade employers from changing their existing policies to try and avoid offering both their voluntary policies and the new mandated emergency sick leave policies. Um, in the second version, that the version that was actually signed into law, those provisions have been taken out. So while we could glean from that that Congress was concerned about requiring too much paid leave from employers who have their own generous voluntary leave policies, it's not explicit. Um, what we do know about the law is it does explicitly say that nothing in the act is meant to diminish the rights or benefits um, an employee is entitled to under federal, state, or local law, a collective bargaining agreement, or existing employer policies. We also know that employers are not allowed to require employees to utilize other available paid time off provided by the employer before the employees avail themselves of the COVID-19 related emergency sick leave. So this decision is explicitly left to employee discretion. Um, we also know that the two weeks of emergency paid sick leave can be used to cover the 10 days of unpaid leave allowed for in the amendments to the FMLA. Um, it's also clear that the leave uh, mandated under the law sets a required floor that must be available for immediate use. Uh, many employer plans allow employees to accrue time off um, the longer they work at the job. These provisions must be available for immediate use. Um, under the emergency uh, paid sick leave, full-time employees are guaranteed 80 hours, like we talked about earlier, um, and then part-time employees are given the average number of hours they worked in the two-week period, or um, if needed, then they go through the process of figuring out what the that average would look like by looking back six months or looking at the employee's expectations. Um, so at a minimum, if there's a state law that required employers to offer less paid sick leave than the provisions of this new paid emergency sick leave, we know that employers have to rise to the level set forth in the new law. Um, also, one thing we can point out, while many state laws allow um, or require that an employee may carry over unused but accrued sick time or paid time off, um, the emergency paid sick leave does not do that. 
Um, in fact, it explicitly states that paid sick time under the section does not carry over. Um, it also explicitly states that an employee would not have a right to receive payment for any unused time under this act upon termination and retirement. So there are some things that we know for sure based on the text of the law. Um, there's some things we can kind of glean from the changes between the two versions. Um, but, you know, accordingly, our best guidance at this time is while the leave could run concurrently with other available leave, employers may not force employees to take other voluntary PTO before utilizing this leave. Um, because this decision is left up to employee discretion, we're advising employers to consider the emergency paid sick leave as creating separate and distinct leave unless the employee requests to utilize the employer's existing policies, which must be more generous than those outlined in the law. So like we've mentioned a few times, we're still waiting on some regulations and should should the regulations change our understanding, then we'll certainly report that to everyone um, as soon as possible. But for now, our guidance is that, you know, this should be considered in addition to. So the next area of questions that we've gotten a lot of involve the Paid Sick Leave Act and when you actually get leave. So as you recall, there are multiple provisions of the act that deal with isolation and quarantine. Specifically, an employee can receive leave under the Pay Sick Leave Act if they're subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. They can also do it if they're caring for an individual who is subject to such an order. And relatedly, if you've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine or you're caring for someone who's been advised. So what does all that mean? The answer is we really don't know. The, the Paid Sick Leave Act does not define either a quarantine or an isolation order in its text. Accordingly, we're all left to make our most best educated analysis. However, we don't think a general directive to avoid public places is the same as an order by a federal, state, or local government. As you know, everybody nationally has been advised to avoid large gatherings, to social distance, to stay in their homes when possible. But there has not been a federal edict or order to that effect. However, we have seen certain locales and states to say there's a shelter in place, there's a curfew. We think those things where they say you can't go somewhere, you have to be quarantined, you have to be isolated, a direct order from a federal, state, or local government, which would prevent the person from coming into work if they complied with it, could meet the requirements of the Paid Sick Leave Act. But general directives, we don't think will fall under that. Similarly, when you're talking about the self-quarantine, you have the issue of a healthcare provider. We understand that nationally, doctors are all over the news telling people to stay home, to self-quarantine. We do not believe that's the same as what is being referenced under the Paid Sick Leave Act. We believe that it would be your personal health care provider, not a talking head on the news, and that your personal health care provider or the person you're, who you're caring for, their personal health care provider, has told them that they need to self-quarantine due to COVID-19 precautions or due to concerns related to COVID-19. We also point out that healthcare provider, while certain things are not defined, healthcare provider is defined in the Paid Sick Leave Act, and that is defined as a doctor who is licensed in the state in which they're providing the advice. So that also goes back to you can't really take the general advice of other people, and also there is some standard as to what requirements a doctor has to meet in order to be able to tell you to self-quarantine or isolate. Leah, do you want to take question four? Sure. So with the FMLA, as all of you know who are in charge of overseeing your company's FMLA leave policies, um, intermittent leave can get complicated fast. So a lot of people are asking us whether or not um, the law allows for intermittent leave. Um, the good news is, is no. It appears the answer is no. Um, while the first version of the bill passed by the House appeared to leave intermittent leave on the table, the final version does not. For leave taken under the FMLA amendments, 
provision, the leave is limited to, as Jean DeLayla talked about, leave required when schools close and a parent must care for a minor child and providing that care prevents the parent from working or teleworking. Um, this type of leave is highly unlikely to be intermittent based on the nature of what we know about the quarantine orders and the self-isolation um, and just the closings of schools that we've seen. Um, they're not closed for a week on and a week off. They're simply closed for X amount of time. So um, should we start seeing intermittent school closures, then, you know, we would have to hope the regulations address it. But as it's written now and as we understand the situation with school closures, it doesn't appear that there would be any intermittent FMLA leave under the amendment in the law. Um, for the leave taken under the emergency paid sick leave, the law says explicitly that paid sick time provided to an employee under this act shall cease beginning with the employee's next schedule work shift immediately following the termination of the need for paid sick leave under subsection A. Um, accordingly, we interpret that provision as well to prohibit intermittent leave under the emergency paid sick leave provisions. Um, so as the law is written and without any regulations, now we would, we would interpret both of those to say no, there's no intermittent leave. Yandalela, you want to take the last one? Yep. So the last question we've received a lot of is, under the paid sick leave provisions, may an employer request certification from the employee or the employee's doctor? So the answer is that there's a good argument you can. There's a provision in the paid sick leave act that allows you to request that employees follow, quote, reasonable notice procedures after the first day of paid sick leave. If that provision was intended for you them to just tell you they need leave, it wouldn't make sense because it happens after the first day of leave. So we interpret that as meaning that you can ask an employee, provide some basis or some backup for their need for the paid sick leave after their first day. We think that it has to be <coughs> – we think that the employer can request that an employee follow the reasonable provisions in effect in the workplace for other absences including certification from a doctor where it would normally be required. However, where the employee is taking leave for one of the covered reasons that are not related to the employee's own health or the health of immediate relative for whom the employee is providing care, the CDC and various other entities recommend that employers limit the reasons that they require an employee to make an unnecessary trip to the doctor's office while health care resources are spread thin. While it would be fully reasonable to request a doctor's note, for the approved paid sick leave reasons that impact the employee's health, like that the employee is experiencing symptoms and seeking medical diagnosis, it would be less reasonable request where the employee is using the paid sick leave due to a mandate that the employee shelter in place or that there's a local school closure. So we're advising our clients to use, you know, best practices, common sense, and practical approaches with a little extra bit of consideration because we understand that we're all navigating this alone, but we do recognize that there is a concern about potentially people seeking leave when they're not entitled to it. And with that, we want to thank you guys for joining us today. We do have a the firm has a task force and additional resources available for all of our clients on COVID-19. We understand that this is a challenging time. It's an extremely fluid and involving situation. And we have set up this email address that is pictured on the slide for questions if you have a general question. Um, if you have more direct questions or you'd like to discuss a specific concern, we recommend that you reach out to your primary Kilpatrick Townsend point of contact. Uh, we are all working to meet our clients' needs during this time, and we want you to know that we are here to support you and make sure that you have the best legal advice. In addition to Leah and I, the next few slides show several of our other colleagues here in the labor and employment team at Kilpatrick Townsend who have additional information on COVID-19, who are well-versed in the law and can provide you with guidance. And with that, we want to thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thank you.